Hello, everybody. With me today is Fred Gillen, Jr., local Westchester singer, songwriter, producer, recording engineer, mastering engineer, mix engineer, and probably several other things I'm leaving out from the musical world. But uh, thanks for being with me today, Fred. I look forward to asking you a lot of questions and finding out more about your music and your processes and everything else. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So we'll jump right into it. Uh, at what point did you know that you wanted to pursue music and you wanted that to be your sole uh, pursuit in life? Uh, I would say basically probably in junior high, it was kind of clinched. Uh, I think it kind of started in about third grade, but I think it was junior high that where I finally, you know, where it really clicked. It started with, you know, getting a record and reading the credits and thinking, I want to be one of these people. I don't, I don't really understand what they're doing, but I want to be one of them. And then in junior high, what really happened was that I realized that I wanted to play the bass guitar. And that was my real entrance into being a musician. Nice. All right. So what, uh, so you started on bass. What is your favorite instrument at this point to play? If you had to narrow it down to one, I know it's a hard question. Um, I think that's a question I would answer every single day and it would be not in an instrument broadly, but a specific instrument. Like, you know, yesterday, my favorite instrument to play was my, coach dog uh strat with p90 pickups a few days ago my favorite instrument to play was my guild bass that i did a collage on um i had a day where i was just playing the banderia a whole bunch uh so it, it's really more like that and what's funny about it is that i always had a couple of basses at least but for a while, I only had like one electric guitar and one acoustic guitar. Um, and I felt that that was fine. Now I have a whole bunch of instruments. Yeah. And like, you know, every day is a different mood, you know? Yeah. So, interesting. All right. <laughs> uh, Give you an excuse to keep all the instruments. Yeah. <laughs> Got to oh. justify it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so w if you had to name one artist, who would it be that, that inspires you to keep creating music? Cause I know all creatives, you know, go through periods where maybe you have some doubts or, Hey, maybe you're not feeling inspired or you think, Hey, this, this life is too hard. Is there any one artist that you would say you keep going back to that inspires you to keep at your craft? You know, if I think about my whole life, I would have to say the band Rush. Probably, you know, I've probably listened to them more than any other, you know, recordings. Yeah. Okay. okay. So probably not what people who know my music are expecting so much, but it's, yeah. it's true. And I think when Neil Peart died, like, it was the first time that someone I didn't know personally died that I felt it that strongly, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I remember when John Lennon died, but I, I didn't feel something like, like that. It really took me by surprise and it sort of made me think about just the extent to which I've spent, you know, time listening to them. Yeah. And, and one of the things in answer to the question it, about them is that they went through so many changes, you know, they just followed, the muse wherever it took them. Hmm. So. All right. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what is your songwriting process? Do you have one process that you kind of, this is, this is my go-to. I always write music first, lyrics first, a little bit of um, both, or does that change with every song? I would say that, you know, there's a sort of a basic process that's maybe 70% of the songs I write, not the exact same process, but the basic process, which is uh, I usually start with some lyrics um, and they're usually not even a first draft. 
usually a, a, a slightly later draft than a first draft. Although that that is part of the process that's a little more that deviates a little more. Um, so that's I'd say that's my in terms of basic. That's my overall most prevalent process. Yeah, and, and um, I sort of. I sort of generally have some musical stuff kicking around in my head that's associated with that lyric. Um, sometimes it's as simple as this sounds like it's in the key of E minor in my head. And sometimes it's as complicated as I can, you know, like literally hear the melody in my head, you know, as if it was already fully formed yeah you know so it varies a lot in, in sort of that within that range but oftentimes it's 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 that pro process of like i think the chords of this are e minor basically e minor c and d and that's where it seems to be going that's where the lyric these lyrics make me feel those chords it's usually more vague like that. When there is a fully formed melody in your in my mind, it's really nice. It's like, oh, this is great, you know. But yeah, um, it's a little more of a process than that usually. Yeah. All right. And, and and in terms of what the lyrics are, man, that's there's a lot of revision. I know we, you and I have talked about this, sec, you know, privately, yeah. but a lot of revision. I know people people don't necessarily realize how much and it probably varies artist to artist but I think in general the, the re, there is a lot of revision for most yeah. artists yeah. the other thing I would say though is in, is with co-writing I've co-written in some different ways but also about 70 percent of my co-writing has been sitting face to face like this and just just either you have a tiny idea or you have nothing and just doing it you know just sort yeah. of like brainstorming and and you know i mean i wrote that way with um all the songs i wrote for hot rod pacer with jim keys um that's how he wrote i wrote a half dozen songs with matt turk that way i wrote a song with that song price of progress with abby gardner from red molly that way so that's that's more commonly in my process co-writing which is a much different process than my own. Yeah. All right. Um, of of all your albums you've you've done at this point, which one do you think you're most proud of, and, and why? Um, I think it's the tie between uh, "Silence of the Night" and my last EP, "Birds." um and why silence of the night i think is an epic failure in every way it's probably literally my least successful album up until no probably my least successful album in terms of sales in terms of getting any radio play in terms of anybody giving a crap about it uh, or at least me finding out anybody gave a crap about it yeah. um and musically, I sort of, you know, didn't quite get what I was going for in a lot of cases. The cases where I got what I was going for, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. The song Silence of the Night, the song um, Morphine Angel, the song uh, um, Black Butterflies, and like a couple of the others, you know. But I think that's, I really love that record because I thought the CD was already going to die at that point. So I made this crazy long album with too many songs on it. And it's kind of, it kind of, it, it was like, I just feel like I was just really going for broke in a way. It was much less of, this is going to fit within these boundaries and much more of like, this is my last chance. I got to really, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it 
for me in terms of what I did live from there forward, it sort of opened the door to the idea that I actually could mix all of these different things in a, in a set. Yeah. The folky sing along thing, the dark open tuning thing, the political, the personal, the really heartfelt, the intellectual, and I could mix it all into one set. Because to me, that album is sort of, sort of like a, 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 you know, a live set of a sort of the mix of the range of what I do. Yeah. Um, and then the latest EP, Birds, is tied for my favorite because I think in terms of chords and melody, particularly chords, I really went to a new place. I really opened new territory and did things that were in the past wouldn't have even sounded like they were in the key. You know, they would have sounded like they were just too far out of the key to do. And for some reason, it's like my, my, my mind expanded a little bit. I think it was because, uh, you know, of COVID. Yeah. Because I was home, I didn't have any paying work, I wasn't on unemployment yet, and I was just really writing in an in a emotional stream of consciousness way. And But I got this idea of this structure that all the songs had bird metaphors, because the first song I wrote, was um, the Robin's return and it had this bird metaphor. So I just felt like, and I felt like I took a step. Yeah. I, I, I really toyed with the idea of sitting on it a while and trying to get a full length album out of it. But I realized like I was done, you know, like it hit me, like I'm done. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I haven't even thought about writing since then. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even like thought about it. <laughs> well, so did you make a conscious effort to say, hey, I, I want to put some more unique chords in here or that just no. came to you as the process was was uh, unfolding? I think it was just, yeah, I think it was just that literally, like I said, that it was like my mind, my musical vocabulary expanded, you know, it was almost like, because I listen to so much different music and it's a lot of it's, some of it's kind of out, you know, I mean, so the fact that I go back to the, these Neil Young kind of chords always intrigued me, you know, in terms of time, you can tell I listen to Rush a lot because I have time changes all over my music, but, but the chords have always been kind of simple, you know? Yeah. And I also started more complicated and I've gradually gotten simpler and simpler. So I, I just feel like all these influences kind of, maybe or they were given space by the daily life of being sort of quarantined, you know? Yeah. Um, and not seeing any people. And like the freaking birds were literally my companions. <laughs> it could be worse. <laughs> it could be worse. Uh, so if there's one song that you would say represents Fred Gillen Jr. the most, which would I, it be? It seems like that song, The Devil's Bluff. Yeah. Okay. That's what it seems like to me. Yeah. That's that's certainly a great one. Thank so, you. yeah. You're welcome. And um you know, the, um a few people have played it besides me and the band the Yayas uh recorded it on one of their records. Oh, great. Um, I don't think anybody else recorded it, but other people have played it, which is fantastic. Yeah. I think that's always probably one of the the best compliments of a songwriter you can obviously yeah. get is not somebody to say they like it, but somebody to actually like it so much that they play it or record it. Yeah. For like, for, to me, like for a local yokel, I've gotten much more of that than, than I think most people do. Yeah. Well, I mean, which is a testament obviously to, you know, to you as an artist and a songwriter and all the work you put in. So uh, <clears throat> now a little bit about the pandemic. Um, you know, obviously you were saying some things there actually you think helped with your songwriting and your creative process, but in general during the pandemic as a musician, uh, songwriter, recording engineer, mix engineer, how, how have you all been deal? How have you been dealing with the pandemic? Um, um, well, at the very beginning, 
for the first couple of months, I'd say, I guess it's been about, I've been home for four months. Uh, I think it was like March, you know, March 18th. When I was yeah. like, okay, that's it. And I had had people in the studio, like the, I don't know, like the 14th, 15th and 16th. Those, you know, it was like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, packed. Yeah. And then uh, I think it was that Wednesday, when I kind of walked into my house, I was like, all right, I'm going to leave the house in two weeks to go to the grocery store and that's it, you know? And it's been like that since. And like, um, at that beginning time of the first two months, I had some projects that were still, you know, sitting there where people were calling me and say, Hey, you can mix that without me. Now I wanted to be there, but now forget it. I'll you mix without me. And then I had a few people send me, um, I don't know if you know, Don Treisman, but he's a songwriter, but not really a musician. So he has other people record his songs. So he oh. sent me, we did three songs at the beginning of the pandemic. And one of them, I got to channel Frank Sinatra, which was unusual for me and cool. Um, Very nice. And, and yeah, you know, so I did those three projects. I did a fun video project for the band Hudson Valley Sally, where they each recorded themselves with their telephone and they, and they, did a video and they sent me all of those kind of crappy, you know, tracks and I edited it together into real time and mixed it. You know, they weren't in time or anything. They just right. oh, okay. know, put the track, put the, the basic on the headphones and they sang into the phone. Um, so that was fun. That was for a Phil Oak song night. They were, that they was, had become virtual. And then, you know, the work ran out, right? So, and then I had also been doing these Facebook live streams and I've been making money doing that. And then, you know, like, first of all, my, my internet connection seemed to be failing me on that. I had some yeah. moments where I was like, this sucks. You, you know, the sound is messed up. And, and then like people really stopped PayPaling me and Venmo me eventually. It was like the thrill is gone. And um, so then I was like, you know what, this is just, this isn't working um and that was it i applied for the unemployment which has been wonderful since then it's like i mean i guess at some point you got to start thinking about booking gigs again but yeah i haven't thought about it you know the first three weeks my last gig was march 6th probably the first week i was home i was really antsy because i hadn't played a gig in three weeks and I'd say when I hit a month, that went away. Yeah. And now, I don't even want to say this out loud, but I don't miss it at all. <laughs> I don't miss performing at all. Yeah. That's... You know, um, I'm basically just in my little space by myself, practicing all the time, like for hours and hours. And yeah. like really in, enjoying that. You know, it's not work. Um, and the thing is, like, I I had a period of time last winter before this pandemic where things were slow, or maybe it was the winter before, actually. The last couple of winters have been tough. And I sort of got addicted to practicing. You know, like, I, I'd get antsy if I didn't go practice. Yeah. It's so, like, that's where I am at now. I'm not writing at all. I don't even care about that. I'm sort of like, when when the time comes, I'll write again. You know, yeah. So I'm just just playing the instruments. And nothing wrong with that. I think that'll certainly benefit you when the live performances come back. And, and I think once you start playing, you will crave playing again. You know, I think once you get into yeah. a few of them, you'll. Because I, I think. So. Yeah. I think I also this has brought me. I, I think I was on my way to an existential crisis before, because of the way the business has gone and you know, my own situation and going to Nepal to play concerts in Nepal four times in India once and just being treated like royalty over there and all that. Um, I was heading towards the existential crisis and now I'm there. <laughs> so I'm sort of at a point where I'm sort of, I'm sort of rethinking everything. Yeah. So, you know, not only don't I think a lot of my, gigs are coming back unfortunately but i also don't know if i'm coming back you yeah. know in a lot of cases 
yeah. um, that I'm going to be less of like, I do this full time. You know, like I'm t sort of thinking I'm, I'm sort of thinking I'm going to have to take a step back from that because the work isn't going to be there. But I'm also feeling like I, I've always needed to, to, to need to make a living from this, you know? Yeah. And it's like, obviously I don't need it anymore because I'm still going to practice for two or three hours a day, even if I have a part-time job. Right. You know? So I don't know. That's, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with the pan pandemic. It's, it's definitely been a time for, I mean, in some ways my daily life hasn't really changed that much. Which is right. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it's but like opinion. not being involved in the music business as in booking, bookkeeping, promoting, hustling has been the most wonderful four months of my life. Yeah. Wow. I miss working with other people in the studio. I miss that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You I know? can imagine. And when, when I get to the point where I have no work in the studio, I'll, I'll, then I'll write because I want to record something. So I'll need my own material. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> I jones for that, but I don't jones for lugging, you know, thousands of dollars worth of gear in my car to a gig and getting underpaid and yelled at by drunks and all that other <laughs> stuff, you know. Why not? <laughs> I mean, yeah. the thing is, it's like, I almost feel like the good parts of that I still get in a way because people reach out to me, you know? Yeah. And so the, the connections with people are still, I'm still hearing from people, the good connections. Right. So I don't know. The drunks aren't reaching out to you. <laughs> but the, yeah. But the, the, all the stuff that is the hard part of this is gone, you know? Yeah. And you realize just how little you actually get paid as well. You know? Yeah. Um, so change it a little bit, but this is also something you did during the pandemic. You released three EPs, right? Yeah, three EPs. And uh, one of them had uh, the going to the supermarket dance mix, right? Yeah. Or maybe that wasn't part of the EP. Maybe that was a separate right. single. Yeah, I did a dance mix too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what inspired you to do that? And how did you like that? Did you um, think like this might be something I, you know, revisit or was it kind of lightning in a bottle? It worked for that song and it was fun, but um there's always there's always like when when you have fixed time there's always the temptation you know to do something like that or certainly to do a different mix yeah and i don't think it's precisely the first time i've done it um but i think it's usually just been i have in my mind what the mix is and i'm working toward that and when i get it and i'm like this is done whereas Going to the supermarket it was just such a fun, goofy song. And people, when I did my live streams, people really responded to it. And I thought, well, heck, I got fixed time. So, you know, I could take out, completely take out the real drums, add in some more elements of the drum machine and some little, you know, just, yeah, you know. Go, 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 you know, some of that stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't go as crazy as I could have, but um, yeah, it was fun, you know, and I think the yeah. result was kind of fun. I, I actually like the rock version better because the rock version sounds exactly like I heard it sort of lines the sound in my head. Okay, yeah. But, but I, like, I like the other perspective of the dance mix, you know, it's, especially <laughs> since it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's always yeah. good to experiment, uh, and the fact that they both came out those good. Fast, is... like loops, you know, those kind of fast swirly loops and stuff. I mean, yeah, you know, I did when I did the record with Koji, um, the uh, Coney Island record. Some of the songs stayed pretty straight, but there's a couple of songs on it where he really did that. Yeah. You well, know, um, there's this song called "Gone," which is really sort of personal you know kind of almost confessional kind of song and then he put this like you know swirly real dance stuff in it yeah and i think there's an irony to it that is cool you know right so you know Co my friend koji has always been a big um just influence on me in, in a lot of ways you know even though we've never been in a band together or really played together yeah so I, 
you know, there's other people that are more obvious because we've played together so much, but you know, he's, he's just kind of, kind of always, I just have conversations with him where we talk about music, you know, it hasn't happened in a while. He's got a baby now and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. I should really call him, but uh, you know, it's um, yeah. You know, you have those people that you, you bounce stuff off of. I mean, like you sent me, you know, you sent Leo and I, your record, you know, like, like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. It's huge to have that, that feedback and that rapport with people that right. can, you know, you can exchange ideas with. Yeah. These EPs, I didn't play for anybody. I did them completely myself. Oh, yeah. Isolated. <laughs> I would say to Peg, you want to hear the thing? And she would be busy and I'd see maybe for a day and then I'd be like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going <laughs> to put it up. And then she'd be like, "Whoa, you did a dance mix of going to the supermarket? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what do you think I've been doing for hours and yeah. hours? <laughs> you think I've been sleeping in the studio? <laughs> yeah. uh, so one of your other songs from the that you had mentioned earlier, The Robin's Return, I know it has uh, the bird sounds in that. Did you record those? Yeah, I hike, on a, I hike on a bunch of trails around here, but the one particularly Graf Sanctuary, um, has this like sort of little valley with a lot of tulip trees and you 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 don't get a lot of road sound or anything you know and, and the, the birds kind of echo there so I, I've done recordings of birds there before yeah. I mean on the other EP I did that song instrumental frogs and I recorded the tree frogs at Britain Brook Sanctuary and that place is like I'm deeper in the woods so the road sounds aren't an issue yeah um but yeah, I love using field recordings in the recordings. I mean, I, on my record, um, uh, Match Against the New Moon, there's a song called Primitive Angels. And Matt Turk and I were, were doing a gig at, at Happy Hour at Coogan's in Washington Heights. And, um, you know, we recorded uh, the sound of the drunk, packed Happy Hour bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and the people sh- you know basically shouting because you have to shout to be heard and yeah all of that stuff you know because it was like supposed to be like hell's waiting room <laughs> <laughs> yeah i enjoy the field recordings as well because they really add uh a lot of depth to you know certain tracks yeah and it's like i mean i, I don't know about you but i grew up listening to pink floyd a lot you know as i mentioned probably not quite as much as Rush, but pretty close. Yeah. And Pink Floyd always had all that stuff, you know, like like the real operator. That's like a real operator. Um, when he's, you know, calling home and there's a man answering, you know, and like, oh, yeah. apparently that was a real operator. Wow. You know, and they just sort of said, let's see what we get. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta, gotta keep experimenting. Yeah. Uh, so, so what are some positives that you, that you could see coming out for the music industry coming out of the pandemic, you know, since we've all had this time to kind of sit back and reflect and reevaluate things. The only positives I see are creatively. Um, I think like what happened for me, I think people's minds are going to expand. I think people are going to get out, out of their day-to-day routine out of their comfort zone out of their safety zone um i think artists and especially in our genres where there's words um who are never political are going to become political and you know maybe write topical songs maybe also write songs like the my bird zp which is not which is much more metaphorical you know yeah um but is obviously about what's going on in the world in, in many cases. Um, I think that when people are able to be in the room together again and work together, I think that the time alone is going to benefit the getting back together, but also that the getting back together is going to be very inspiring in itself. So there's going to be like this, this isolation time. I mean, what better for an artist than to be isolated? You know, you just, but at a certain point, you sort of need to reflect the world because, you know, that's sort of your, your job in a way, you know. Uh, yeah. Sort of 
remind people of their humanity. So, you know, I think all of that stuff is going to be positive. And I think a lot of things are going to happen that are kind of going to be really interesting and unusual and, and new things are going to happen. I think in terms of the business, um, it's positive in the sense that, you know, most of it is going to die off and I don't have, I'm not a big fan of the music business. So if it just died to me, it wouldn't be a big loss. <laughs> I hate to say that. The people I know that work in the business that are great, you know, are great. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's, I think personally that it's moved more and more from music people towards business people. You know, like yeah. when I was coming up, it was run by a bunch of music freaks and they got into it because they were obsessed with music. Mm. Now it's like, it's a, it's really like a business now it's corporate now. And I mean, it was corporate then, but it was a different kind of corporate. It's like, I got to know uh, Hale Milgram, who was the CEO of Capitol records for about 20 years. He signed Radiohead. He brought Radiohead to the United States. Um, and, you know, he was rock the vote. Hale was, I think it was possibly even Hale's idea, rock the vote. Um, and like, this was a guy that was a clerk at a record store. He was a, a child of, um, I think, Polish immigrants. And, and he just was like a, a clerk at a record store. Where, you know, he was the cashier at the record store. And, and he got that job because he was like, a, you know, one of these music freaks. And um, not even a musician, you know? Yeah. And like, ended up as CEO of Capitol Records. Amazing. And when Radiohead came over here and they were tanking, he told everyone at the company, I don't care how much money we lose, these guys are gonna change rock and roll forever and we're gonna, we're gonna be the ones who did it with them. And so I just want you to promote them and just, you know, promote them as if they were geniuses, cause they are. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I got that story from, I met him through one of his employees, Barb Prisament. Um, and Barb told, told us that story before we met Hal. Yeah. You know, um, and I just thought this was a guy that responded viscerally to the, the music. He wasn't thinking about money or business at all. Even though he was the head of a giant corporate record company, he wasn't even, that wasn't even on his radar when he heard radio. Yeah. He was just like, this, this is big. I want to be a part of it, you know? And I just feel like, and you know, when he left the company, he, they, they pushed him out the door. They had to pay off a five-year contract and he was only six months into it. So he got paid like $5 million to leave. And there was a lot of that that happened around that time. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm, look, I don't know enough of, to really even talk about this stuff, but I just remember what it was like in the, say in the early nineties, you know? Yeah. And uh, I just remember what it was like when I was in the rain deputies and this independent artist thing was just starting to happen. And um, things were happening like Beck, you know, with Calvin Johnson, they were making, you know, 500 copies of a single and sending it to radio and getting it played. And then, and then, you know, selling 500,000 records and then getting signed by Geffen, you know, so Jane's Addiction, same thing. They they made a self, they made that first self album, and you know, and they sold a hundred thousand copies on their own. So you know, um, and I remember when I was in the Rain Deputies, we were having, we were having, uh, we were doing a gig with another band, and we had just gotten called by a couple of independent radio promoters trying to get our business, trying to get us to hire them to work our record. And it was, it was like three grand. It was a lot of money at the time. Um, I voted for doing it. I voted for like maxing out whatever credit cards we needed to max out and doing it. And, but it was, you know, it was two to two. We voted and it was uh -huh. two to two. So we were deadlocked. So we didn't do it. 
and we were having dinner with this other band and they were like, yeah, we're selling guitars and we're like borrowing money from our families to do this radio, the same thing, a radio thing. And I was working in a gourmet shop and I walked into work one day and I heard them on the stereo. Yeah. And I was like, what the heck? This sounds like Emmett Swimming. And my boss was like, oh, it's the CMJ CD. I was like, you have it? Where is it? I said, yeah, like, sure enough, it was these guys. So they had actually charted in CMJ because wow. they had hired the radio promoter. Yeah. You know, and then they ended up having like a four or five album career with whatever label they signed with, you know. Oh. So it was like a lot of that. Yeah. Know? Um and those and those companies they wanted yeah. you to they wanted you to tour a little bit independently before they would sign you too. Because they wanted sure. to make sure you weren't gonna kill each other. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and you were a danger. Like, yeah, and you weren't gonna like go down in a haze of drugs and late night yeah. you know because not everybody sure. can help being on the road yeah i mean i talked about the band rush you know they fired their first drummer because they were afraid he was gonna die you know he was like just he went on the road and he just exploded you know he was like party 24 hours a day and he was yeah. diabetic apparently. Yeah. you know so um yeah. Anyhow, so yeah, I was in that, those situations and those meetings and stuff. And, and you know, the whole thing kind of shrunk, obviously. Um, it's growing back, or it was growing back again at, before the thing, but the, the, the model of how it was growing back, you know, was just not for me, you know? Yeah. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, recording side, which... The fun part. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing is now it's like, oh, how do you make mu <clears throat> How do musicians make money? Oh, you got a tour. Uh, obviously, there's not as much money in recording as there used to be. Like you're saying, selling five hundred thousand records now. You know, yeah. people expect you to make money on streaming, which is very minimal. But right. Anyway, I I also love recording, and I know you love it, and yeah. uh, you have the studio, and obviously you've spoken about how much you love that and working with other artists. Uh, so what's your favorite piece of recording equipment that you own oh that's a tough one <laughs> um i mean the things i use i couldn't pick one i don't think um you know i could probably pick 10 things that are <laughs> totally go to yeah. I could maybe, maybe I could pick, I couldn't even pick my favorite microphone or my favorite preamp or I could pick my favorite compressor. My favorite mm -hmm. compressor is the LA four, um, which many people mod to make it into a cheap LA two a. Oh. And it, to me, the LA two a is a different animal and I don't understand why it would ruin an LA four by fixing the flaw that makes it cool which is that it's very slow and so because it's slow it warms things up because it compresses the you know the low frequencies really slowly you know yeah it's an optical compressor and um but yeah i mean that's like that's definitely one of my favorite pieces of gear um I really love my warm audio uh, tone beast preamp. Um, I really love my uh, my Ampex uh, three. What is that? Three fifty one or three sixty one? But the big the big Kahuna preamp out of an old uh, two track tape deck. Yeah, I love that thing. Um, I love. I actually recently got a warm audio. Um, the telephone can clone the 251 and that mic has been wonderful and i love my um my ev mics like uh re re18 the re11s i have a couple of those i have a few of the, the ones that you have the what is that the 10 re10 yeah and so i think i have two two of those i also have 664s and, which are super cardioid as well. Um, and I have an, an RE20, which on 
an upright base or a base cabinet is fantastic. Um, let's see what else. Um, and I, I'll be honest, like I have a Mac pro, the cylindrical one, right. it's, flat, it's flash and that computer is wonderful. And, um, the interface I use is wonderful. The Motu 16A. So I became a gearhead. I never thought I would be a gearhead, but I, I am. I love my Crown PZM mic. That thing is so, such cool stuff I can do with that. And all, all, the, all my ribbon mics. I've got one of those Bayer dual ribbons, which is wonderful. I've got, uh, and I've got some, a couple uh, modded ribbon mics. Oh, yeah. I have an active ribbon mic from uh, Karma. The, oh. It's called the K6. Uh, so yeah, I love ribbon mics and dynamic mics. Yeah. Um, condenser mics I use sparingly, you know. Oh, yeah. oh, the Sheps. I love the Sheps um, C5Cs that I have. And also the EV635As, which are the opposite of those other mics. They're, they're omnidirectional. Oh, okay. So these EPs I just did, I use those as the overheads on the drums. Oh, interesting. They're darker and they get more cymbal tone and less, you know, less uh, cymbals. Yeah. All right. Let's see if we can send this inter interview to uh, some of those companies and get you sponsorship deals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and of course, you have as well the preamps from um, Neve. Uh, Rupert Neve. Yeah. And I have a lot of DBX compressors, and they're the, the DBX compressors, they're workhorses. Yeah. You know, I have the 166. Uh, sixes, the one sixties, the one sixty fives. The I have a bunch of those. And I've been collecting them for thirty years. All right. So, uh, with all that being said, you've obviously listed a lot of great equipment that you know how to use, and you make stuff that sounds great. If there was one free piece of gear that you could get, you see, you pick any piece of gear in, in the world, I'm going to give it to you for free. What would it be? Mm. I mean, it, you know, it's pretty likely it would be a microphone. You know, if it was in good shape, probably an M49 Neumann, because I lived with gyms for a while, two of gyms. And, yeah. you know, it's um, multi-pattern. Um, it has two diaphragms, two of those, I think it's called the M7. See the M's for M's, but it's that really famous uh, Neumann um, capsule that's in a bunch of microphones. Yeah, yeah, it would probably be that. You know, if I could have, if if it had been, you know, if it had made sense, I would have tried to buy one of those because Jim sold them. Yeah, um, but they just the tube is, uh, you know, um, extinct. Oh. And, you know, um, Telefunken has a shipping container full of them and, you know, uh, yeah. power supplies in those mics, the mics themselves, they're really beat up. They were really, you know, I mean, they kind of threw them around at, at CBS, you know, they, they just looked at it like a, a hammer, you know, they, just yeah. it the shelf. they didn't put it in the case. They didn't, yeah. you know, and then just to get in a cable, you know, those cables I think are extinct as well. Yeah. They're used in a couple of other mics. They're used in a couple of the communist, uh, you know, the Gefell mics. Oh, yeah. The other, the, the other Neumann company, the one in East Germany. Yeah. So, um, you know, it just wasn't practical. Yeah. But if I could get one that was refurbished and I had a couple extra cables. Yeah. Free, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, uh, <laughs> right, so, uh, sadly, I can't make that come true, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was curious of the answer. You know what? There's also another thing I would love to have is that Sony mic. I don't remember the model number. It's a tube. It's a tube condenser mic. Yeah. Okay. It's from a certain period. All right. Um, I can't remember the model number. Yeah, I'm not familiar Probably with it a, either. Yeah, a letter and a number. You know. Yeah. So. All right. Um, so I know you're a Pro Tools user, just like I am. Have you ever considered 
moving away from Pro Tools and going to any other DAW or? Every time I've upgraded, I've considered that. <laughs> you know, when That's I smooth, get, huh? <laughs> when I'm in the middle of the upgrade, I'm always thinking, why do I do this? <laughs> <laughs> I, f I really think that the, mo the corporate model of the company is like, they make it harder for the people that actually want to buy it and pay for it. And the people that are going to steal it are going to steal it. You know, yeah. I've, I've been in situations several times where I've like gotten punished for paying for it. <laughs> you know, I, I thankfully have never had that issue with pro tools, but uh, yeah. I can certainly imagine it's extremely frustrating. Yeah. It's like, they're, it's like, they're like that guy that's like, money first you know like i just feel like they it's like you know their first priority is the um the, what you call it the um the uh, license licenses yeah it's like the first question they ask you and it's like i don't care about the license i just want to use the thing you know <laughs> <laughs> i get the yeah. license stuff i totally get it you know i understand they're trying to make a living we should have put licensing on our music. Well, that'd be nice. DVDs had that. DVDs had code. Right, right. Well, they still do, yeah. yeah I mean, well, do. for those DVDs that are actually still being manufactured. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so. Um, yeah. so when it comes to the DAWs, do you, do you miss the days of, I mean, the DAWs now are obviously very visual. You can see, oh, here's the waveform and everything. Yeah. Do you miss the days of, the analog recording where there was no visualization visualization and you were just mm. using your ears um you know what i really don't uh mm. especially with subtractive eq because it really is so much easier on the with the visual and i usually know you know within a certain range what frequency i'm 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 looking for, I'm hearing. Yeah. And so to, to, to use an EQ that's visual where you just sort of put the point in and bam, and then you just move it. You know, you used to have to, you had the Q and you had the frequency and then you had the boost and cut. Right. You had three knobs and it was, I mean, I think when I was on a console, I didn't have the chops I have now. So it's really hard to make that comparison. Right. Okay. Uh, um, I do know that I did live sound at in the in the um, smaller room at the town choir not too too long ago, and that board is still analog. Um, and going back to you know a console and doing live sound, I felt like I was like, wow, um, I know what I'm doing now. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And I feel like to some extent, subtractive EQ on the computer with the visual sort of was, it sped up the learning curve in a way. Right. You know, um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's funny, my friend Jim Keyes, he still uses a console. Oh. You know, he just could never get over it. But for me, I, I, I didn't, I, if I can ever, you know what, you asked that question before what one piece of gear yeah what one piece of gear might be the kind of console that i can never re you know just will never be within my reach yeah you know one of those i'm not sure which one i would choose but one of those consoles you know from and one of the vintage ones you know yeah that would be a different story i think okay yeah i'd, I'd go back to a console pretty darn quick if it was you know a, 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 maybe a trident or an ssl or a yeah. you know, neve or, or an api even in one of these new apis you know i don't know much experience but yeah uh, and i have to say if i had an actual poltec eq i would definitely use that out of the box for eq yeah uh, that's a perfect segue to my next question. Yeah. Plugins or analog gear, which is your preference? Um, neither. I'm I'm pretty on board with both. Yeah. Um I I pretty much 
you know, I set up my system to mix out of the box somewhat, but I never go out of the box when I'm mixing it, you know? Yeah. It's, Only on the, in the recording process on the way in. Yeah. But on the way in, and I never use EQ on the way in. If, if, I, if it needs EQ, probably the mic placement is wrong. That's the way it is for me. Um, I might use a little bit. I only have a couple channels that even have EQ. Yeah. You know, I may, you know, I may do something a little bit on a bass drum or, you know, there's a few things I might use the tiniest, tiniest bit on a bass guitar or direct track. I might give it a little bit of like 110 or something, but generally it's just the preamp and compression, but I use compression a fair amount. Yeah. You know, I have all these compressors and I, I use them. Um, and I think that happened gradually over time. You know, like I sort of started to realize this is, you know, this is going to get compressed, like the lead vocal, it's going to get compressed. Right. It's going to get compressed in several stages. And some of the gear, some of these compressors I have to come in with, uh, you know, sound really great. So I'm just going to go for it. You know? Yeah. Um, but it changed a lot when I went, I guess, to from Pro Tools 8 and below when I went up to 9 and above and I could have the plugins in when I was tracking. Yeah. You know, that, that changed it a little. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't use as much compression. My, my curve on compression, I was using more and more compression coming in. And then it went down a little bit when I, when I could actually have the plugins in line. Gotcha. You know, so, but I think in my opinion, the, even though compressors as gear are, might be the most diverse, you know, ranges choices. Yeah. Um, the plugins are great. You know, compressor plugins that are out there. Are great. Yeah. You know, whereas reverb is like reverb, whatever, you know, it's kind of like, yeah. To me, reverb is more about how you set it. Yeah. You know, just yeah. setting it. So. Yeah. They've, they've certainly modeled a lot, a lot of the analog gear too. So you have the digital options with the compressors and then you also have the digital versions of the model yeah. analog ones. So you really have a, and they're, they're definitely not the same, you know, but yeah. But some really great stuff. I, I, I mean, I have compressors that, I, that are my go-tos. And there's, you know, got to be at least a half a dozen that I use that are totally, you know, I use equally. Yeah. Equal amounts, you know, so. And a certain one I use on the drum overheads a lot. certain one I uh, use on, like, all the rest of the drums and the bass. Certain ones I use on, you know, vocals i mean you know it's really um yeah it's interesting how many are available i mean there's a on the vocals i use a fairchild uh, you know uh mod you know mod and um you know like that one and i don't really use it on anything else just on vocals yeah you know i've tried it on other stuff and it's just yeah that the the color it imparts is really great for for a lot of vocals so yeah well it's about you knowing the gear and what to use in the right places which i think is right. why you're why well, um, i'm so paranoid about upgrading my software <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly where i was going but yeah. <laughs> but yeah i understand that as well uh, so you you might have answered this question a little bit or at least limit eliminated one of these choices but if let's say you could only do one of these for the next five years right record perform live mix master or produce if you had to choose only one uh which would it be sounds like performing live is out but um well the thing is i mean there's this that was five choices uh write record perform live mix master or produce I think so the six, I seventh guess. choice would be just play. Yeah. Okay. For me, that's the most important. Play the instruments and sing, you know. 
Yeah. Whether anybody hears me or not, you know. Okay. Um, but out of those six choices you just gave, I think my favorite thing to do is recording. Yeah. You know, more than producing even, more than performing, more than mixing, um, recording. Yeah. I love setting up the mics and placing the mics and coming up with ideas for weird, you know, using a, a mic that you wouldn't expect or, or, or just the logic of, you know, matching in your mind what's going on versus, you know, what microphone does this job, the yeah. job I'm looking to get done, you know, most perfectly. You know, I mean, I've been using a, the C1000, but on the supercardoid setting, on the snare drum, a lot. Like on my own stuff, you know, on yeah. those EPs. And it's like not a mic that people typically use on a snare drum, but it's a supercardioid, small diaphragm condenser mic. Um, and especially with the brushes, it's, it's, um, it's super, so it cancels out the hat a lot, but it just picks up all that, you know, all the soup, stirring yeah. the soup, you know? So I've been using it a lot, you know? And just stuff like that, thinking of, I'm, you know, thinking like, what am, I look, what am I going for here? I always get so much of the soup on the snare out of the, off of the room mics or the overheads, you know, and I'm like, you know, what if I want to put the cymbals really low in the mix? Like, I'm going to lose most of the soup, you know, yeah. what I call the soup. Jeff Irish always called it the stirring the soup, you know, the sound of rushes, you know. The sh -sh -sh. Yeah. So I just thought, well, this microphone will do it. You know, and I'm not a big fan of the under the snare mic. I, I use it. When I record somebody else, I always have two mics on the snare. But um, to me, it serves the mic underneath serves its really specific purpose, which is not stirring in the soup. Right. You, know, you really get that off the top head. So um, that's the part of it that geeks me out the most. Yeah. You know, that's why I have, you know, 30 microphones. Right. <laughs> but it's really, it really is my favorite part of it. Yeah. I mean, obviously making those important decisions up front makes the mix job easier. So, you know, obviously yeah. a lot of these are kind of interrelated, but. But also like when I record a band, it's also, though it's important to get it right up front to make the mix easier and better. It's also important that they can start playing. They can start performing as quickly as possible. So right. there's, I love the balancing act between I got what I need, go, you know? Yeah. Like, not going to sit here. There's, there's tracks on band records I've done where the, you know, the bottom mic on the snare, uh, you know, the snare, the snare sunk went down and it's touching the bottom mic and the snare and the bottom mic of the snare is rendered useless. Yeah. You know, and it's like, who cares? We have the top mic. There's yeah. a song in the hot rod pacer record where there's no top mic because uh, I was, for some reason not using a template and I was just setting up the session and the band was raring to go and I, I routed two things to the same track by accident <laughs> and so yeah. I lost the the top mic of the snare all I had was the bottom mic and you know I thickened it up and we worked with it yeah and Interestingly, that song, the snare has this a little different of a sound and it's a lot of people have really commented on the sound of the drums on that song. <laughs> so I'm like, shit, I should have done that in the whole album, but <laughs> it wouldn't have suited some of the others. So it's a very light song. Yeah. You know? Jake's okay. playing the drums lightly, you know. Yeah. So one of those happy mistakes. Yeah, you know, or, or a mistake that you turned happy and you know, he made lemonade. Yeah. I do love that too. Um, I just really love the way it's all such a process, you know? Yeah. And I feel like producing, there's times when it's appropriate to, 
do a lot of pre-production and map everything out. And there's times when it's appropriate to do the Leo Harmony approach, which is the, you know, just fly by the seat of your pants a hundred percent, you know, yeah. cause his, his music is, that's what it is. It's really spontaneous and it's really like, there's no head. It's all heart. You know, it's all just like, he's like pouring his guts out, you know? Yeah. And so to produce him that way with a total openness, you know, seems, um, you know, it really seems to work and it seems appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, sometimes you want to pull people out of their comfort zone. Like, um, I always feel like with Leo when the time comes to do that, I hope I'll know it. You know, I did a record with, um, the record Abby Gardner and, um, Anthony DaCosta, Bad Nights, Better Days. Hugely critically acclaimed record, got a crap ton. In the folk world, it was like, it was a, in the like, folk singer song or the world, it was a big record. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I got a lot of, you know, credit for it. I got a lot of people like come, I man, people come up to me at the Folk Alliance conference and call me a genius. <laughs> and I was like, right? What? And the thing was, we recorded the album in three days, basically, 85% live from the floor, really? you know, which was not Abby's comfort zone at all. It was really her uncomfort zone. And, um, you know, pretty much everything that happened was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> well, for geniuses, that's the way it works. <laughs> well, it's funny because I told this person, I was like, do you understand all I did was get the hell out of the way and roll the tape. Yeah. Sometimes being able to make that decision yeah. though is the, you know, some people can't make that decision. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, so. I think there was one song where I actually, we actually mm -hmm. talked about the arrangement and the lyrics and did like normal pre-production kind of conversation and maybe revised a couple of lines or something. Yeah. Basically it was just like, you know, we brought, um, I think we brought, Steve Kirkman in for some of the live sessions and we brought the bass player, Mark Murphy in for some, you know, for like, maybe he was there for one day of live. Um, we couldn't get the cello, the cello player live. So she was overdubbed, but there was just a lot of just go in the room. I mean, I actually remember the New York times sent a reporter to interview Anthony at the studio, Mark Murphy, Steve Kirkman, Abby Gardner and I were in the room in the recording room screwing around like jamming <laughs> while Anthony's sitting on the couch with this like Upper East Side looking she's I think she's from Fairfield actually she's like from Greenwich or something she had Connecticut plates on her Benz or Beamer or whatever but <laughs> very like you know like designer suit yeah very put together kind of woman you know not like us at all you know not <laughs> not blue jeans and T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's sitting on the couch with this kid interviewing him, and he's like, you know, really experienced musicians are waiting in the other room <laughs> to record the music, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. Funny how it all works. Yeah, but I just think it's such a process. I mean, when I did Carolyn Solabello's, the third, I did three records with her as a producer. The third record, um, she had a bunch of demos. So she came up and sat in the chair. I put a microphone up, recorded a bunch of demos. And we talked about the songs. We did pre-production. And then she got involved with this Real Women, Real Songs thing where every week you, you get a prompt. And for an entire year, you write a song around that prompt. And then you end up with 52 songs. So she started doing this. And was, she was really inspired by it. And like, so she came in to record and she was like, you know, and we talked about the demos and this and that, but I'm doing this real women, real songs thing. So she would write the song on, she would get the prompt on Thursday. She would work on it all, all weekend and bring it to Jack Hardy's songwriting group on Monday. And then she would come to the studio and um, she was like, let me show you this song. I wrote it, you know, I, I, I don't even think it's done. And she played me the song and I was like, let's take this bit and make it a hook at the beginning and put it here. And you know, we did a little of that stuff. Yeah. And there's two lines 
I think you could come up with stronger lines for those two lines. You know, we did a little bit of that. And then she would put down, she would sing it and play it with the acoustic guitar with a click. And then she would leave. And um, I would play the rest of the instruments. I'd produce it up from, you know, um, and then I would send her an MP3. I'd say, what do you think? And, it, and the whole album ended up being Real Women, Real Songs, um, except for maybe one of the old songs she included. And the rest was all, yeah. you know, these week by week. Each week we would do another song. And like after she left, I'd, I'd finish it, literally. I would just, you know, I'd finish the song. You know, I'd play drums and bass and guitars and backwards shit and weird stuff. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's... It was interesting because the album before that, we put together a rhythm section and we, we cut the basics live from the floor, oh. you know? So, and, and everybody had the songs and there was a lot of pre-production. We had a couple rehearsals and I was at rehearsal as the producer, you know what I mean? So it was really interesting to sort of go from this one extreme to the other for a, yeah. both, both records were a big, you know, fully produced kind of thing. Cause the first record we did was really like close to solo acoustic. So, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, how many different ways you can, you can do this. For sure. For and I sure. always get frustrated with these people that come in and they have this very rigid, like, this is the only way to do it. You know, this is the way I've always done it. Right, right. Why yeah. do you do it? Like, because that's how we did it in the past. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've done records so many different, it's amazing to me how many different ways, you know. Yeah. Yeah, each one has its own personality the way the way it's going to yeah. come out and you know you know i, I don't know who's going to listen to watch this because <laughs> but i love talking about this stuff it's so much fun you know <laughs> it's got to be like five people maybe that don't want to well, we'll see we'll have to give a special code out for anybody that's made it this far <laughs> <laughs> super nerds <laughs> the super nerd code yeah uh so, so i have a couple more questions uh oh uh, if there's one thing you could ta change about today's music industry, or, or sorry, if there's one thing about today's music industry that you like, and what's one thing you would like to see change? So what's one thing you like about the music industry right now as it is, and what's some one thing that you would like changed? I, I know it sounds like there's several things you would like to change. And um, Okay, so the thing I like, um, one thing it, it it's kind of one thing but it's one it's kind of conceptual is that all all music is world music now and because of the accessibility of things and the internet and and all of that music it travels around the world and you hear it in people's music you hear these influences that used to be at best only for the super nerds people who you, know, you had to like really look for if i wanted to find some like west african you know uh drum music or whatever i had you had to like really look now it's everywhere i mean i i, I record i i did a live stream of a, a nepali folk song and sixty thousand people in nepal watched it it went viral and uh, sammy you gotta be quiet um and you know so it's like and people were like oh my god you playing you know but to me like that's totally normal now yeah For this white guy in new york to be playing a nepali song and singing it in nepali so i think that's great and i hear it in some of my favorite current artists like zola jesus i mean she's got so many influences that you can't even you know you can't even put your finger on what the heck is going on yeah um i love that i love the way it's all connected and um you know you, you just it's just traveling all over the world um if there was something i could change um it's that in terms of recorded music um i'm not saying that people don't um care about it as much or don't uh you know love it as much or whatever but it's like you look behind me 
you know, all of these records. And like, I know what's there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what's there. And it's, 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 um, when I am homeless on the street, I'm going to have a shopping cart full of records. <laughs> Cause like, that's the last thing I will give up. Um, so there's a certain sense of like taking ownership of it and really, you know, lugging it around and treasuring it. Um, like when we were kids, if you wanted to have portable music, you had to lug some thing around with you. You know, you had to like, you had to, the, the boom box or whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so mu- music is really easy now. Yeah. It's, it's, and that's great. And like I said, that's my favorite thing about it. You know, that's, that's the thing I think is great is that it's so easy to get and so accessible. And so, and you carry it on this little device and it's in the cloud and all that. Um, but I also think you, we lose something with that as well. You know, yeah. Um, I mean, literally years ago, I would have been in Nepal going to, I would have gone to a record shop while I was there and I would have bought some Nepali records. Right. And now I'm like, I go on YouTube, you know, and I mean, I still buy records, but the point is like, I would have been like, this is my chance to get some Nepali music. Right. When I get home, I'm not going to be able to find this stuff. You know, it'll be so rare. Yeah. And now you can find it, you know? So it's like, uh, it would have made it a destination. Like today we're going to the record store. And it, so, so it's like that aspect of it. I really miss, I miss the credits being able to really read all the credits right on the, the product and that it was a product and you know, all yeah. of that. And the feeling of buying a record, you know? Right. I love that feeling. Um, like, you know, I, I worked and I made $25 an hour. I'm gonna spend eight bucks on a record. You know, this is like, this is an investment. You yeah. Know? So I miss that, I mean, if I had to choose one or the other, honestly, I would choose the accessibility. I would choose people being able to be global with music um, because I think ultimately that might help to change the world, you know? Yeah. It might help to, to, you know, make us let go of some of our hate and our fear and all of that, you know, because I think music changes the world, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I feel like that's a trade-off and it's a trade-off that I might bitch and moan about sometimes, but, uh, but really I'm just bitching and moaning. Yeah. You know? I just want to tell people that's totally cool. I'm in my kitchen cooking. I'm listening to music on Pandora or YouTube, or I'm getting it from a device. Totally fine. I, there's no credits. I don't know what the hell's going on, but just try going to a record store, you know, and, buy some old used records and see what it feels like. Cause it's kind of awesome. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, you go, I think about like going to big gyms uh, uh, up here, you know, you have big gyms by you. Yeah. And like, again, these conversations with him kind of, they're like this conversation, you know, uh, you know, just about this, all this music stuff, just music, 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 you know? Yeah. Yeah. We miss um, out on that. But I also think like high school kids, when I look at what they're listening to and how diverse it is, it's really cool. You know, it's yeah. really cool that they, they have that, that right. ability, you know? So there's gotta be a way to balance. Yeah, hopefully the pendulum, you know, swings back a little bit. And Yeah, and I think there was a period of time when it was balanced, you know? And um, I think like for myself as an artist, I benefited from that time period greatly. Yeah. And it allowed me to have a career as an independent artist that I may not have been able to have. Um, if it had been the, the old days when it was purely, you know, records and stuff, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And if it had been today, I wouldn't have been able to literally pay my con ed bill or anything. And so I was in that middle area where I benefited from it, you know, from yeah. this period of time when it was both. Um, I'm grateful for that. And, and, you know, 
if I can't make any money on recorded music, well, I can't now, you know, real, any real money. Um, I mean, I never made money on it. Here's the thing. I mean, it wasn't that you made money. It was that you could spend a few thousand dollars, hire somebody to do radio for you. You could get on the radio. You can get in the newspapers and magazines and get reviews and really get your music out there in a way that seemed to stick that got you gigs, put butts in seats, and it made touring viable. For me, it really made touring viable. Yeah. You know, the record promoted the tour, not the other way around. You know, so that's what's, that's why I'm not touring anymore because right. the record doesn't promote the tour. And I actually tried hiring somebody to do like a Twitter thing and all that. And I mean, I got a crap ton of play for uh, Prayer for America on uh, Spotify. And I got, I mean, I just saw in my statement from the fourth quarter of last year, you know, public radio. 3,000 streams, which corresponds to 3,000 actual radio plays because they are all stations that have streaming, but they also have a terrestrial. Oh. And like, you know, um, I just feel like it, it didn't, it doesn't, it doesn't stick in the same way. I feel like it creates a situation where you either get a zillion plays or else you may as well get nothing because it doesn't do anything. You know what I mean? Like if, unless it's viral. Yeah. When it is viral, you know it. Because I got many thousands of friend requests from Nepal. When that video went viral. I mean, I had people, the name is in Nepali. I can't even read it. <laughs> and I got every expat Nepali in the United States and the United Arab Emirates and the, all of that, you know, in the Middle East and stuff. I mean, it was, uh, it was beautiful. It was great. I answered as many of them as I could keep up with. Yeah. But even if that had happened here, you know, if the thing is you need to do that over and over and sustain, you need to hire influencers and make that happen over and over and over and over again in a way that's just exhausting. And then does it really work? I've talked to a lot of people who've actually pulled it off who said it didn't really work. It didn't put butts in seats. Hmm. So, you know, how are we supposed to make a living touring if we're not putting butts in seats? You know, that's the thing when they say you're, you're not selling records, but you're, you're making a living performing, but it doesn't really work out that way. So I, I don't understand um, how it works, you know? Yeah. I hear you. Um, so if you could bring one musician back from the dead to have a jam session with them. Who to have a be? jam session? Yeah, or just, to, you know, maybe if it's one person, you guys are playing uh, acoustic guitars or anything. Yeah. That's a different question than just if I could bring one person back just to hear them. Yeah, no, it's it's to you to be able to you know, mm. hey, let's uh, go into the studio and play or something. Yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, I didn't expect this question. Oh, you know, I got to try to come up with some. Uh... <laughs> like the, first, the first 10 people I think of, I would just be way too intimidated to even play with them. <laughs> so it's like, it has to be somebody that's sort of, we're, you know, at a level that I could even <laughs> yeah. be in the room with them. <laughs> You know, I mentioned like Rush, you know, like Neil Burt. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I just want to sit in the corner when he's practicing. I don't want to try to play with him. <laughs> I mean, it'd be like, I feel like it'd be like. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it would be really fun to play bass with Sam Cooke. That's interesting. You know, yeah. To be the bass player in Sam Cooke's band for three hours. Yeah. And just completely get my butt kicked. <laughs> guys. And, and, but just to be standing, you know, like with Sam Cooke, playing the bass, particularly with Sam Cooke. Uh, you know, I'm not a good enough guitar player to do that anyway, but, but on the bass, I could pull it off. And, 
you know, to be standing behind him and he's singing the way he sings and being Sam Cooke. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Cause he's for me in terms of singers, he's like, there's something about Sam Cooke that just really, you know, you know, just deep really affects me deeply and just in the way he sings yeah you know, just the way he sings so that would be one um i would love to be able to bring back elliot smith just to hear him because i never saw him live which yeah. was so stupid because i knew about him on time to have seen him live but i didn't so he's he but I, you know to play with him i don't know yeah. you know I man could be his bass player that would be fun. Yeah. Especially if Janet Weiss was the drummer. If it was like Elliot Smith and Janet Weiss and me, and maybe Sam Combs could be the keyboard player instead of the bass player and I'll play bass. I could even play Sam Combs' Rickenbacker because I used to have one and I miss it. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because that was, I loved it when he had them as a band, uh, Sam and, uh, and Janet Weiss. All right. Uh, this is another thing that sadly I can't make happen, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Standing behind it. Sam Cook playing the bass. And he's using my M49, getting his spit on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's being recorded through a console, SSL. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. That's almost at the end. Uh, and I one question. Uh, do you put a period after Junior, Fred Gillen Jr.? Well, apparently on Spotify, <laughs> yes and no. That's <laughs> why so I was hoping maybe we could solve it here and now because so, you know I, I see it on in, the streaming sites and various places. Yeah. Both in life, I put a period after junior, and I've never used a comma. Ever. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've I reached a point where I said I'm going to ditch the period because you know with the internet, certain in certain situations, the period messed with things. So I was like, yeah. it's better without the period. So I'll do without the period. And, you know, I, I sort of got that idea when I was with uh, Tom Smith, um, who did the cover art for Gone, Gone, Gone. He was designing a poster for me. And he said, no, we're going to take the period out. And here's why. And he kind of, you, you know, you like lined it up. And he's, I would call him, he's a great designer, but he's a text, like, Guru. deep expert on text. Yeah. You know, and on color, actually. So, you know, he taught me a lot about text when we were sitting there. And, you know, he took the period out. It was like big difference. Yeah. In terms of the layout. So, yeah, I mean, I tried to fix Spotify and, you know. Good luck. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, doesn't sound like we've, doesn't sound like we've completely resolved the issue. <laughs> no, and if you're, searching me on spotify you got to go fred gillen jr with the period fred gillen jr with no period fred gillen comma jr comma jr and the really crazy thing is i think that the 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 thing that always comes up on top is like the first thing i ever put on spotify because it got has the most plays yeah and it's self-perpetuating because it's what it's the only one under that spelling and it comes up first or something mm -hmm. So it people it gets more plays and it just keeps staying at the top. Yeah, and that, that pisses me off too. Oh, well, whatever that is, whatever you release next, it's got to be released under that iteration. <laughs> I guess. You know, but yeah, it's frustrating. My three, my three EPs are not on Spotify. Yeah. Well, that's so that's that's kind of my uh, concluding question, actually. Where where can people find your music or yeah. you know about your about you and your music in general? You know, you can always find the info on my website, fredgillenjr.com. Um, but the the three EPs are only on Bandcamp. Um, but on my w website, there's a discography page. Yeah. And so there's a little bit about each album, and there's usually a you know a link. Um, so is that fredgillenjr.com or Fred Gill fredgillenjr dot dot com? Yeah, only one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Which is exactly an example of the kind of thing that the period messes with if you, yeah because it becomes code or something you know right right so um okay 
but yeah, the three EPs are only on Bandcamp. The rest of my stuff is out there. It's on Amazon and Spotify and all that. You just have to, on Spotify particularly, you got to deal with the three spellings and all that. Yeah. So, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, Why? Well, uh, um, CD Baby, you know. Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about this privately. I, I like Bandcamp in terms of third-party sites. Yeah. I usually steer people there. And I don't know why the cat's bugging me. It's not, it's not anywhere near time for him to eat. He's yeah. there. Uh, well, I'm out of questions. So the cat, the cat may win in this situation if it's yeah. uh, begging for your attention. But uh, I appreciate the time you've taken today to uh, talk with me and answer some questions and give us a little uh, background into your influences, your recording process, writing process and everything. Yeah, thanks for, so thanks. you know, it's the thing that most people run screaming when I try to talk about it because, you know, they're <laughs> bored. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, I mean, I thoroughly enjoy it. So, yeah. Peg is Thanks. like, you got to call one of your musician friends and talk for an hour because, you, gotta, you know, I love music, but. Yeah, yeah, I have my limits. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, no, it's great to, you know, get the knowledge also and understand your processes because, you know, we all attack things a little differently. and whether somebody's watching and they're, you know, recording engineer or mixing engineer or musician or a songwriter. I think there's, you know, we've gotten a little piece of all those knowledges, a little knowledge yeah, from each and, of those pieces. And for lay people that are just kind of interested, you know, a great thing, I think a great thing is to read the book, How Music Works by David Byrne from the Talking Heads, because he talks about every aspect of music oh. from you know, all the stuff we just talked about, including the business stuff. Yeah. You know? and, and everything from like the fact that, you know, classical music came about because of the spaces that it was being performed in, you know, and, and the same thing with the Talking Heads as a band. They sounded like they did because they played at CBGB's, you know, and things like that. Yeah. It's a really cool book. And he talks about things like how we get paid or recordings and stuff yeah so to really and it's david byrne you know it's it's uh you know there's a lot of stuff for you and i that we know when we're reading it we're like oh yeah you know, you know all yeah this. but it is really like a it's like a one-on-one it's really yeah neat. Oh, cool. oh. hopefully this interview is a good segue to that you know this is the first step and you read that and uh, yeah, yeah but yeah thanks again i appreciate you uh, taking the time it's just yeah. always been talking about this stuff yeah i, I agree so all right well have a nice day, and uh, I hope everybody goes and checks out your music on Bandcamp and on your website, fredgillenjr.com. All right. Thanks, Fred. Have a good day. You too. Thanks. Bye.